welcome to DivCasts from the University of Chicago Divinity School. For more of our podcasts and information about our terms of use, please see our website, divinity.uchicago.edu slash podcasts. Get up to introduce our speaker for today, who I'm particularly delighted to be able to introduce because not only is she a of the school, and not only is she your librarian, but she's also my friend. I'm very happy to have a friend here. Uh, Anne Knapple got her MA and her PhD from the Divinity School in the Bible, and she's now the religion and philosopher bibliographer at the Writing Center. So, some of you, maybe all of you, I don't know, have mm-hmm. already met her. Uh, she also is a former. Wednesday night show. So, she's very critical of no. <laughs> And she's going to talk today about, uh, uh, would you buy this book, Academic Publishing and, research, and the Research Library. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Um, but, uh, so, 
And, and I also imagine, too, that some of you, upon hearing this, um, might be thinking, oh, uh, this is going to apply to my work, and should I be worried about this? Um, and basically, that's, that's what I want to talk about today, is should you be worried about this, and how does that um, uh, fit in with this larger question of uh, where academic publishing is going, and uh, uh, in particular, publishing of print, and how and its relationship with electronic uh, publishing. Uh, so, uh, soon after uh, this decision was made public, there were a series of articles that showed up in the Chronicle of Higher Ed uh, in response to this that um, gave, uh, most of them gave very um, nuanced uh, responses that really brought out a lot of the, the complexities about uh, around this issue. Um, uh, so I've listed those here, and then I've also listed that uh, this this is not uh, this is a conversation that's been going on for a while. So you see, the last article on the list here was written in um, 2011, where um, this article actually talks about um, uh, that. Uh, it interviews a number of editors from university presses who say that they um, would be reluctant to publish dissertations that are available, freely available online. Um, and so I'm going to be referring to a lot of these articles as a whole. So, okay, so I just read the AHA statement, um, and I think. Uh, when I first read this, uh, I think a lot of my colleagues uh, in, in libraries and a lot of people in um, academic publishing were a little confused about why this statement was, going, was made. Um, and so some of the things that come out immediately were um, some of the assumptions, there's some really big assumptions being made from that statement um, that uh, needs some teasing out. So one, the first is, what's the relationship between online, open online access and print sales? Does one, are they competing with each other or are they complementing each other or is it some of both? Uh, second, how are ETDs, which is how uh, we in the biz like to refer to electronic theses and dissertations, um, how are they accessed? Um, in other words, what does open access mean? Um, and uh, it, it's amazing, even people who spend all their time dealing with open access, they're, they're still confused about what exactly open access means. Um, and I think there's confusion on the part of the AHA of open, what, what open access means. There's definitely confusion. Uh, third, uh, are libraries buying published dissertations? Why and, why and which ones? Why or why not and which ones? Uh, that was something that was <coughs> conspicuously or largely absent was the voice of librarians in this in this discussion. It, there are a lot of assumptions made about what librarians are doing, but not a lot of, uh, no one was going and asking librarians what they were doing, um, which is annoying. Uh, and then finally, where is the evidence? Um, uh, what exactly is the AHA basing this decision on? Uh, so I'm going to. The, the articles in the Chronicle uh, focus mainly on the first and the last issue, um, and then I think the, the second two are the one, the two middle ones get uh, um, uh, glossed over. So. so I'm going to go through each of them. Uh, so in the AHA statement, they say that presumably online readers will become familiar with an author's particular argument, methodology, and archival sources and will feel no need to buy the book once it's available. So that's a big assumption, right? If you can access it online, why would you go and buy the print copy, right? And, you know, there's something to that. Uh, but uh, th there's some things, it's, it's a bigger issue than that. There are things to consider. So first off, um, so the library just finished <coughs> a survey of all the faculty, uh, and one thing we asked about was e-books versus print books, and uh, we found that uh, the faculty at this institution, at least, and this is, um, there have been other uh, surveys done at other institutions that show similar results, uh, is that fact that scholars use print versus ebooks for different reasons. Um, for instance, ebooks are uh, really preferred when you only want a short portion of the book, like if you just want one chapter. Um, if you're just interested in what's in it, you kind of want to browse through it. Um, a textbook is they're very popular in e-form, uh, but you know your classic scholarly monograph, which would be 
uh, what a revised dissertation, published <coughs> revised dissertation would be, um, most people want that in print. Uh, they might want to. They might want to access it initially in the e-version just to see if it's worth their time. But if it is worth their time, they want to read it in print. Uh, so, and, and some of that is because of just the way that, uh, that I'm sure all of you have had to use our one of our many many e-book interfaces, and some of them are better than others. <laughs> um, and none of them uh, reproduce. Uh, all of the advantages of, of interacting with a print book that one really has to engage with deeply. Um, that they're, they're better for short engagement right, than browsing. They're great for searching, but they're not necessarily great for reading cover to cover, jumping back and forth, things like that. Uh, second, uh, libraries are the ones who buy scholarly publications for the most part, and not individuals. So this state, this sentence that I've come up with is talking about individual people who read these books are not going to want to go out and read them online, are not going to want to go out and buy them. But I would say most of the people, most individual scholars are not buying a lot of, of print books on their own um, in comparison to libraries, right? You buy very selectively, you know, because books cost money and um, you, why would you buy them if they're at the library? <laughs> so, um, so really, uh, it, that becomes somewhat of a, it's, it's a less, it's the bigger issue is whether libraries are buying them than whether individuals are buying them, because these are, you know, book of the month club books. Uh, <laughs> as great as my dissertation is, I don't think anyone's going to be <laughs> discussing it in book of the month. Uh, and then uh, a third issue um, is, is that there have been a lot of there, there are a lot of indications that free act, electronic a free electronic version of a scholarly uh, publication uh, increases the sales of the print version, not not the opposite. Mm -hmm. And for instance, I was at a talk by Derek Keeley, uh, who's the director of the U Chicago Press, yesterday, and he said exactly that. He said that that they see uh, online. Even even when it violates copyright, they see uh, cop online open access copies of U Chicago Press books as as a form of advertisement for the scholarly books. Okay. So, and uh, uh, yeah, and I have this quote here from uh, Jim McCoy uh, of the University of Iowa Press, another university press. Uh, he says, any dissertation that's on the internet has taken on a life of its own, and that would be a selling point to me. That would mean that there's a market out there for this material, and there could be an even greater market for a revised, edited, well-marketed version published by a scholarly press. Um, and that's something that I'm going to come back to later, is the difference between um, the open access to your dissertation versus a published version of your revised dissertation, and um, basically how, how revised is it, right? And for the most part, we assume that when we're buying revised dissertations at the library that it's a different book, that it's not the same. They do not duplicate each other, right? Libraries do not want to duplicate materials. We don't want to buy the same thing twice, but we do want to buy um, the better quality version. Um, and then finally, uh, there's, I think the AHA is um, is not considering a very real fact of, of our world today, which is that to a certain extent, if you have no internet presence, you have no audience. Um, that and, and you know we in, in academia and certainly in the humanities are are more conservative about <coughs> these things, but at the same time, you know, uh, you know, I guess ask yourself is you know. You expect stuff to be to be able to find stuff online, and if you can't find it online, uh, it has to be really, really important for you to go and, and search it out. Um, and uh, I'll just quick the example of academia.edu. Um, so I my dissertation automatically went into ProPress, but I also posted a PDF on my academia.edu account. Um, and I've had people from Spain download it, from Papua New Guinea, um, from <laughs> Germany. You know, I mean, I don't think these people would have access, found or accessed my dissertation else otherwise. Um, and so that, um, for 
for me is, you know, the, the why I wrote it is so that people would, would read it. So, at least some people. <laughs> um, all right, uh, number two. Uh, so, the quote of this issue of open access. Uh, so, they say that, um, that their institutions are requiring that dissertations be posted online so that they are free and accessible to anyone who wants to read them. Um, so, this, this is just not understanding uh, basically how uh, online electronic ETDs are. Um, uh, are accessed. So the way that your dissertations, the UFC dissertations, are accessed is through ProQuest. And ProQuest is 100% not open access. <laughs> so we paid over $23,000 for ProQuest last year. Uh, so that means that you all don't have to pay to access it directly, in, in that when you go to the ProQuest site, you're not charged money. But you are charged in that you're paying tuition or someone's paying tuition for you. You know, you, you have to be affiliated with this institution to use that resource. Um, uh, uh, and so it, it's definitely not open access. And, then, and because it has a high price tag, that means that not everybody has access to it. So for instance, the Chicago Theological Union right here in Hyde Park um, doesn't have access to ProQuest and doesn't, um, uh, doesn't submit any of the theses written at their school into ProQuest. And so um, while certainly uh, ProQuest gets you access to a, a, a huge number of dissertations and theses, um, and a, you know, a majority of institutions in the United States have that access so that it might feel like it's open access and that everybody you talk to who has access to it, um, it, it's not open access. And certainly, you know, nobody affiliated with uh, People who aren't affiliated with an institution aren't going to have any way to get to that. You know? um, another way that uh, dissertations are uh, posted online is through institutional repositories. It's becoming more and more common. And those are open access. Uh, though usually students have the option to embargo, though it's usually more for a year or two and not the six years that the AHA is recommending. Um, so in that sense, like if you did a Google Scholar search, uh, you could find links to dissertations in different university repositories, and you could access that without um, without trouble. Um, some places, uh, due to budget constraints, are simply just creating PDF copies of the dissertation and loading them into their catalog, uh, which that would usually be open access, and that you, um, you you could just go and uh, go through their catalog and download it, but not necessarily. Um, it might, they might put restrictions on that. They might just want people affiliated with their university or their school to have access. Um, uh, social media pri or private websites is another way that it would be truly open access. So like academia.edu, um, or if you just have a blog and you want to post your, your dissertation on there. Uh, and then finally, this doesn't, probably doesn't apply to most of the people in this room, but um, the, if, you, if your dissertation was written with government funding, uh, you would have to make that uh, at least public access, which means that the text would be available online versus open access where you could download that information and the data and, and, re and reuse it for yourself. So it, it's much more complicated basically than what AHA. AHA sort of makes it sound like um, univer all universities are just forcing students to um, just put up a PDF that anyone can access any time and do anything with, and that's just simply not the case. <clears throat> All right. Um, <coughs> then get to the issue of the dissertation and, and libraries. So who's buying it? Uh, so they're saying that that university presses are reluctant to offer publishing contracts to these PhDs for these dissertations. Um, and like I've already said, for the most part, the people who are buying this are, are libraries. Um, and so uh, in some of these articles, you see uh, a lot of assumptions about how libraries operate, false assumptions coming out. So uh, uh, the director of the Texas A&M University Press uh, was saying that they've become reluctant to consider dissertations um, because uh, so the press, this last line, the press has come to assume that the most that most libraries and library vendors will not buy or recommend purchase of ensuing books that are based substantially on them. Um, 
and that or on, online dissertations, and that that's simply just not the case. Then we'll talk about that in a little bit more. But uh, uh, and then also there's this quote on the AHA website one of the response quotes to their statement. Uh, Jessica said. I was told by two different publishers at the last AHA conference that the book would have to be substantially different from the dissertation because at smaller presses, university libraries are the primary purchasers of their books, and the libraries would be hesitant to buy a book that was at all similar to a dissertation already available on ProQuest. And so, like I've already said, yeah, we don't want to duplicate stuff, right? We don't want to pay $23,000 a year for ProQuest and then spend another $23,000 a year buying the same thing in print. But um, the thing that's missing here is that um, we're, we're assuming is the difference between buying a print copy of the dissertation and buying the published revised dissertation, which is a different work, which is now a book versus a dissertation. Right? And what's also missing is the fact that we're buying so many revised dissertations, let me tell you. Um, <laughs> So just real quick, some background information about how libraries get books. Um, so first off, we don't buy them all. Um, that would make things really easy. But uh, so we, we sort of have books come in. Some books come in automatically. For instance, we set up uh, the series of books or uh, um, books that have a, a dedicated run, like a, a, a commentary series on the Bible that you know how many. Um, volumes are going to be, we, we sort of set up a, a thing with our vendors, say send them all, and they just come in automatically. Um, I've listed here a couple of series that we get automatically, so we get every single volume that's published in this series. And I picked these three out because um, they publish a lot of revised, the majority of what they're publishing are revised dissertations. So I'm not even making a decision on it. Somebody um, decades ago decided, well, not with what one of those is recent, but anyway, someone, you know, uh, made the decision when it first came out, we want everything in this series, and so we get it all. So, uh, another way we have these approval plans, uh, which means that we talk, so we have, um, we don't buy books directly from the publishers. We buy them through third-party vendors, and so we use, uh, for uh, books published in America, uh, the Yankee Book Peddler, uh, calls itself YVP, um, so they get all of the, they, get, they collect all of the books published in the United States, and then they, we tell them what we're looking for, and they winnow those out, and they, some of them they send to us automatically, because they know that there's a 99% chance that we're going to want them, and some of them uh, they, they send in slip form, uh, which uh, is, they send, they send me the information about it. And then I go through all this big list of books and say yes, yes, no, yes, yes, yes. Um, I say yes more than I say no. Uh, <laughs> so, um, so this is another way where books, uh, those that are sent automatically, I see a lot, a lot coming, a lot of revised dissertations coming in automatically that way. Um, we also subscribe to an ebook package through EBSCO, uh, where they they decide on their own what books they want to add to that package, and we just automatically get all of those in e form. And there's a lot of duplication there, so you might, so we might have a print copy and an e-copy, um, but it's entirely conceivable that some uh, revised dissertations are going to be in that, in that group as well. Um, and then I mentioned, so the, the slips, so this is where the majority of my time is spent, is those long lists of books that don't come in automatically, of winnowing out which ones we want and which ones we don't. And I'm going to talk about that more. I put gifts on here just to be for completion. We get a lot of gifts, um, but that's usually weird stuff. Like <laughs> We get a lot of stuff from Nathan Jessup um, from the, uh, uh, the Mormon extremist guy of his oracles against the nations. I keep those. <laughs> so, they're interesting. <laughs> Someone might want to study them someday. Um, so slips. This is what a slip looks like, um, which is that uh, it's, it's like all the pertinent information about a book. Uh, and so from this, I have to decide whether to purchase this book or not. Um, you can see I decided to purchase this book, and um, it's hard to see here. It says go between ten books. Uh, what that is is that we're in a consortium. You've heard of U Borrow and Borrow Direct, 
run a consortium A with the Big Ten schools and B with the Ivy Leagues. And so we coordinate uh, uh, through the vendor of uh, trying to figure out who, who buys what. And um, in this case, uh, 10 of us purchased a copy of this book. Um, and you can see that it is a revised dissertation. So, um, so at least 10 universities bought a copy of this book. Um, I did more, more than that uh, bought that. So, uh, and here I have a quote from one of the, uh, the articles from, the, uh, from a director at YBP. Um, and he says, this, this is really important, this is what got lost in the, um, in the discussion, uh, the AHA discussion and the, the crime of the higher ed. Um, virtually all libraries exclude unrevised dissertations. That means that um, uh, we explicitly tell our vendors, we do not want to see any unrevised dissertations, we don't want any to come in uh, automatically, we assume that we do not want any unrevised dissertations because that would be duplication. That said, thousands of revised dissertations get sold each year. Libraries do not punish this category of books any more than others. Libraries apply various approval plan filters to all titles. Hundreds of other elements weigh in the balance that will ultimately decrease or increase sales. So basically, I, he's saying what um, we librarians, for the most part, could have told you as well, is that we're treating them basically like any other book. Um, that we are treating them like any other book. So, as long as it's truly a revised dissertation. If there's some indication that maybe this isn't a truly revised dissertation, then, then all bets are off. Um, so yeah, so who's buying these books? Me, well, technically acquisitions, I'm kind of telling them what to buy. Uh, so, but the, the people who would be doing this are people who are, who are general specialists in the field, right? My, my specialty is Bible, but I'm buying for all of religion and philosophy. Um, so, uh, and I did a little uh, informal poll of the other, of the, the Ivy League bibliographers in religion. And one of them wrote back to about how they approach revised dissertations. And he said, whether a book is a revised dissertation has no effect whatsoever on whether I purchase it for the collection. I would apply the same standards as for any other book, press, subject, relevance. Um, and so yeah, the, that, that's the sort of stuff that we're looking at. I mean, we have to literally judge a book by its cover in a lot of ways. Because you know we can't go and read all of these books, right? We have to go off of a limited amount of information about the book. You know, it's a method ad, if you will. Um, so things like, who is the publisher? Is this a publisher that um, is known for publishing truly revised dissertations versus um, some publishers like um, Edward Mellon, um, uh, Peter Lang. Uh, sometimes their revised dissertations are, are not particularly well revised, right? But um, even then, uh, a really big issue is topic or demand of, so for instance, biblical studies has a very long history at this university, and in a lot of ways, we, we, need, we need the bad stuff and the good stuff, right? Uh, and so, sometimes it doesn't matter. If it's in an area that I know people are reading about and they're going to want to interact with that book, buy it, you know? Um, and then, like I've said a couple times now, is it really revised? Uh, I, now, another thing to keep in mind is time. I don't have the time to go and check if every, every revised dissertation is available in ProQuest and if it actually looks like it's been revised. There's some things that I'll look for. Um, you can, uh, if the, the time period between the date of publication and when the person graduated. Um, I do this in particular more often than not with French or German dissertations because they simply have a different, um, they don't have, have the same tenure process that we do in the United States. And so um, the, the, there's not the same expectation that the book is truly revised when it's published. Um, and so, so if I see a German dissertation that is in sort of a tangential area and the person graduated in 2011 and it was published in 2011, I'll pass on that one. Um, but if somebody, if one of you emailed me and say, hey Anne, I can't, act, I can't find this dissertation um, 
some other way can we get the published version? Yeah, I'd buy it in a second, you know? So, uh, and then cost is always an issue. Uh, that was another thing that came up with the other Ivy League bibliographers. Is they just said that, um, you know, once it starts going $150, $200, they might do a little bit of uh, soul searching uh, <laughs> um, just to make sure that this is something that they really want. But, you know, like I said, there have been some things that are going to trigger it, and, but for the most part, the automatic is just you're looking at topic and publisher, and if you're dealing with a, a standard academic publisher in a good area, a subject area, you're going to buy it. Um, yeah, and one thing that I find, I find this statement confusing for so many reasons, but one, one thing that I thought was really interesting is at the end of the statement, they, they admit that uh, a published dissertation should be heavily revised and should not be the same as, as, as your original dissertation, is what's being posted online. Um, uh, so, you know, they, the scholar typically builds on the raw material presented in the dissertation, refines the argument, and improves the presentation itself. Uh, and so, uh, the AHA then seems to be saying that they, they disapprove of, of the publisher's uh, uh, the conflating the, the online dissertation with the revised version, um, which would be a fair thing to say if I think publishers were actually doing that, but I don't think that publishers are actually doing that. Um, and that came up in the responses to the AHA uh, statement. Uh, right on their website, uh, a, a number of, of uh, historians uh, said, you know, ideally, they said, please offer some evidence to support this claim. Ideally, not just hearsay, but actual incidents where historians submitted book proposals and were told by publishers that they were not interested uh, because the dissertation is on, online. And then another person said, you know, uh, pointed to this uh, um, study that was done by the um, Center for Research Libraries, uh, and I have an <coughs> abstract here, and I'll just read the last <coughs> sentence. It says, the findings, so they did a survey of editors of journals and uh, university presses and asked them, basically, you know, do you accept public, do you accept submissions that are based on dissertations? And the findings indicate that manuscripts that are revisions of openly accessible ETDs are always welcome for submission or considered on a case-by-case -case basis by 82.8% of journal editors and 53.7% of university press directors polled. So this, those are high percentages. And real quick, I'll show you the... Um, if people are interested, I have paper copies of these. So uh, this is just for university press. And so they're saying 53%, so this part, uh, when somebody you know, submits a manuscript based on a dissertation, it's either always welcome or are considered on a case-by-case -case basis. Uh, but then also another 27% uh, says they're going to only consider them if they're substantially different. But um, I mean, this is what, I, I think we've all been assuming in, from the get-go, from before online dissertations were available, is that if you're publishing it, you've significantly changed it from, from the original form. And uh, the fact that we are questioning that uh, suggests that a, a, sort of, um, a bigger issue than uh, the online access, the bigger issue being, um, have we, are we getting to a point where we're just People are just publishing their dissertation because they feel they have to, you know, and not because uh, they want to um, rework the material into, into a different format. Um, but also interesting to note is that only seven, so only about 14% said that either they don't consider them at all or that they only consider dissertations that were written on campus. So while yes, it's true, this study shows that certain uh, Press editors are biased against online disserta dissertations that are posted online. Uh, the uh, majority of them, 80% uh, of them, are considering them in one form or another, right? Are giving them uh, giving them a chance. Um, 
And so, I mean, I don't know for every press, but like for instance, University of Minnesota Press, 40% of what they publish is revised dissertation. So, uh, th this is in a lot of ways the uh, bread and butter of university presses. Uh, and I think also, what does, didn't come up in the discussions, but I'd like to see uh, the same survey just asking about revised dissertations in general and taking out the online access. Because my guess is it's going to be the same percentages. That uh, really the issue isn't whether it's online or not. <coughs> the issue is whether um, it's revised in a way that's acceptable to, to the publisher. Uh, so, real quick, uh, the AHA does respond to some of this stuff. They're basically saying that, you know, we talked to some editors and their major concern is that students have a choice, that, that, that that's what they're worried about. And that's, that's fair. Um, and so, you know, should you embargo your dissertation? Uh, uh, basically, things to consider. First off, uh, embargoing your dissertation is going to limit access to your dissertation which means it's going to limit citations of your dissertation. Uh, and so less people will know about it. Uh, it's going to limit feedback. Uh, less people will read it, and you'll enter into less conversations with your colleagues about it. Uh, an embargo could also mean that no one can access your dissertation at all. Um, because <coughs> at the University of Chicago, we, we don't do print dissertations. We don't keep a print copy in the library anymore. The only way you can access it is through ProQuest. Um, now, that might be a bad decision on our part, but that's the reality right now. Um, fourth, um, like I said, only a small percentage of university publishers aren't accepting them. And also, university presses are not the only presses out there that publish uh, revised dissertations. All of those series that I showed earlier were published by uh, non-university um, and by good, respected scholarly press. Um, I don't know what the assumption, uh, there's a bit of an obsession with the university press in this whole debate, and it confuses me. Um, but finally, at the end of the day, it's your decision. And I would agree with the AHA that, you know, you should be empowered to do what you want with your dissertation. It's your work. Um, and uh, if, if you want to give, away, give it away for free, that's great. If you don't, that's also great. And it's just, you know, uh, you, you need to do what's best for you. Uh, and, and then finally, I'll end with sort of what I think are, I think this is really endemic of a, of a much bigger, some much bigger issues going on in academia right now. Um, that there's a lot of anxiety about, and it's sort of just coming out in this form. Um, and I think one of those is, should we be publishing dissertations at all? Like, have we gotten to the point where um, this is not the best way to get the dissertation out to the world, is the traditional publishing? Like, now that we have ProQuest, now that we have all of these social media sites, now that you can set up your own website and you can tweet about stuff, should we, should, should we, should dissertations just be automatically put into some online repository and then you move on to your next book, you know? Uh, I put a quote here, I won't read it, but basically the, it's a, a history professor from Princeton who's saying, you know, you spend all this time working on the dissertation and you get it done and it's wonderful and then you're expected to spend the next six years working on the same project <laughs> instead of moving on to something else. And in some cases, you make it worse than when you started. Because <laughs> you're so afraid to pick up it, you know? Uh, and then another on the opposite side of that, there, um, is this the best use of, like I said, we're buying, for, for the most part, we're buying all of the revised dissertations. But is that the best use of library money? Um, should, should, could that money be better spent someplace else? Um, you know, on non-book, on non-book form like uh, uh, online databases or or on different books, um, on the weird books that we're passing up because we can't afford them. Uh, and uh, yeah, uh, so I'll, I'll stop. So uh, thank you. Can elect not to publish or publish a part of the dissertation? You can em 
borrow go your dissertation on pro Yeah. So and you can um, so you you have to petition to do it. You can do it for one to two years, and then you can petition to renew that. You can also once you make it available, if you change your mind, you can petition to have it taken off. More and more people are doing that. Uh, uh, it was like five, did it three years ago, 15, two years ago, 45 last year. So, but that's out of, you know, over 400 dissertations. So embargo is not something, I mean, it sounds individual, and it is not necessarily only a, sort of a move by all the graduate students. No, no, it's just very individual, yeah. So. And it is something that can be done, I'm just mm -hmm. exploring what this embargo means, yeah. uh, how the university would find it. It can be in perpetuity or it has to be renewed? Yeah, it, it has to be renewed. And so the automatic is you would either request one or two years, and then if you wanted to, you can um, submit that request again at the end of that, that embargo period. So yeah, we're not, AHA wants it to be, give the option of at least six years. Um, and you, theoretically, you could do that here. I don't know if anyone's had, but yeah, you could just keep renewing. And, and at that time, it wouldn't be that it would disappear from ProQuest, it's just that the title and the abstract would be there, but people couldn't access the, um, the full dissertation. So. Uh, how does copyright fit in for this? Uh, well, so, like, I own the copyright for my dissertation. Um, it's, I give ProQuest permission to uh, to make it available, but yeah, I, I, I can do whatever I want with that material. Um, there is an option to, uh, it's like publish, open access publishing, um, which you'd have to talk to Ellen Bryan in the dissertation office to get you know, better information, but basically you can pay to publish it open access, in which case you do give up your copyright, uh, your copyrights to it, and, uh, and then ProQuest puts it into a, a different database that is that is truly open access to anyone uh, on the internet. Um, I was just wondering at the end you had mentioned that maybe moving away from the republishing or publishing of the re revised editions. Um, is there anything at this stage where it's an expectation of, of a PhD candidate to eventually have a book form of their dissertation? Is that something that is changing too? Or <coughs> is there an expectation there that? Yeah, and that's a bigger issue that I bring up. But no, uh, in the United States, you, you have to publish your dissertation um, to get tenure. Uh, it, that, that's just assumed. To, in a book form. In a book form, yeah. Well, I mean, yeah, yeah. It, it would be a bit of a gamble, I'd say, at this point, to publish it. You know, like if, yeah, if you did the online publishing. Um, and one thing I, you know, have to say is, any, you know, recently graduated uh, PhD students and uh, you know junior faculty, not before <coughs> tenure, you know, that is not the time to be rocking the boat. <laughs> so leave it to the tenured faculty to to mix stuff up. You know, you got to do. Um, what your tenure committee wants you to do. <laughs> and so if everybody publishes in, you know, a book form in a scholarly journal, a scholarly publisher, do that. So, but I think that's also leading to people, you know, publishing things that, um, that why that anxiety, that suspicion has come up around dissertations, because we know that you have to publish them. And so, and some people, we also know that Junior faculty are incredibly busy, and uh, you know, did you really revise? We also know that editorial staffs are very busy. How much did that publisher really? How much work did those editors really go into helping you revise your dissertation? So, like I said, I think it's there are bigger issues at hand here that really um, it, are, are tangential to what the AHA has picked up on. I'm curious about the um, the polling of current faculty mm -hmm. and their habits of use with regard to yeah. electronic books and, and hard copy books. Mm -hmm. I suspect that the current generation of PhD students have different habits than our faculty and in turn that our students will have different habits in relation to the use of electronic materials, the use of print materials, for what purpose, why. Um, 
are those considerations and the, the likelihood that those patterns will change, are those considerations part of both the AHA worry and in your response and other responses to it? Yeah, um, well, first I would say that it, it's hard to say whether there, there is a generational divide. Like in the survey, we found that emeritus faculty were often the pushing all electronic uh, versus uh, the younger faculty, and it's because they work at home. <laughs> I said, so they don't want to go to the library. Um, so, uh, and, so, um, and, and that, yeah, there are plenty of young faculty members who were saying, you know, uh, please, God, keep buying print books. So, um, uh, I think more is an issue of the technology. The technology for ebooks right now is just not um, conducive to scholarly engagement. Um, and be, until be. that changes, I think we're going to be buying a lot of print material. I don't think that was really behind the AHA statement. Um, I think it's more of a, um, a I mean, the stuff that they brought up was sort of the concern that, uh, of not being able to get it published and this idea of uh, that maybe you could get scooped if it's out there. Though I think actually the opposite is the case. If you don't put it out there, then nobody knows that you've said this stuff, and then somebody else can reasonably claim that they just didn't know that you had written about that. Did I answer your question? We only have time for one more. I think the situation is somewhat different in the physical sciences. Mm -hmm. Are the university ever going to uh, attempt to? <laughs> yeah, that was another interesting thing about the faculty survey is that. Um, we really thought that while well, science is going to be all electronic, and humanities is going to be yay print, and social sciences would be somewhere in between, and that really wasn't the case. What was the case is that yes, scientists are uh, overwhelmingly using more electronic resources, but it's because of what they're reading. And for the most part, they're reading journals and short essays out of books. And those are really easy to uh, access electronically, but when they want to read a monograph, they want to read it in print for the most part. Um, but uh, that said, certainly the Karar, the Science Library, and um, the Business Econ Bibliography <coughs> at the Reg, um, they are very e-focused. They um, buy almost entirely uh, electronic uh, e-books, um, and. and uh, and then by print of just those, again, just, but again, I think that's because the books that are being published in those areas tend to be essay books, collections of essays. Um, so I, I think there is actually quite a bit of uniformity across the different areas and how they're accessing things and what they want E and what they want print. It's just that um, they uh, are accessing different things. Thank you very much. Yeah. We thank you for listening to or viewing our podcast. For more information and for other podcasts, please see our website, divinity.uchicago.edu slash podcasts. Copyright, the University of Chicago Divinity School. Thank you.